first. And then this is a little more upbeat, standing, yeah. lift it up, yeah. your grace finds me. Yeah. And so I'll just do the two. Awesome, thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Guys who do that are lame. I know. I've seen that happen a couple times. Weird, right? Might even happen tonight, we'll see. <laughs> well, good evening once again. Thank you so much for joining us. Would you please turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 7, please? 2 Samuel chapter 7. <clears throat> Last time in our study, we saw David made some fatal mistakes in bringing the ark back into Jerusalem. You recall that? But then he changed his ways and had an incredible time of worship and celebration as the Ark of the Covenant has now triumphantly made its way into the city of Jerusalem. Tonight, we're going to see God's grace on full display in the scriptures. We're going to study chapters 7, 8, and 9 tonight. So be here for about the next two hours. Your calendar's free, right? It's all good. But the title of tonight's message is Gripped by Grace. Would you bow your heads with me one more time as we seek the Lord's blessing upon our study? Father, once again, we just want to say thank you for allowing us to gather, and we thank you for the privilege to be able to have your written and spoken word right in our hands. Lord, I pray that this would not just be a, another Bible study, Lord, that just gets relegated to the corners of our minds and our hearts. But Jesus, you would speak to each one of us, Lord. Your Holy Spirit would etch the things we need to learn on the tablets of our hearts. Whenever we study grace, it's easy to rejoice in how much grace you've given us, but it's oh so hard to give that grace to others. So Lord, would you work in us and through us that we may be examples to this lost world. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Chapter 7 of 2 Samuel begins with a rare period of rest for King David in Israel. Let's read verses 1 and 2. It says, Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Here we're given another glimpse into the heart of David. He's in a period of rest. He's looking out the window, and his eyes behold the tent which holds the ark of God, the ark of the covenant. And David wonders to himself, hey, why is it that I live in a beautiful palace made of cedar wood in the presence of Almighty God, the ark, just dwells in a tent? David is so filled with gratitude and so concerned for God's glory, he wants to do something special for God. He wants to build God a house. Verse 3, Then Nathan the prophet said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, Nathan is a prophet of God. We just saw that. And Nate hears what David says, and he's like, Yeah, Davy, that's a great idea. Let's build a house for God. It makes perfect sense. What could be wrong with David building a temple for God? And what we're about to see in our study is God says no. To be clear, David's ambitions aren't selfish. His ambitions are good. He wants to honor God. But listen, it's not God's will. And this section is absolutely dripping with application for you and I. Because the question really for you and I at this moment in our study is, how do we respond 
when God says no. Verse 4 through 5. I should read 4 through 6. It says, But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. God tells Nathan, hey, I've been dwelling in a tent for over 400 years, and I've been fine with it. Verse 7, the Lord continues, Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? God is reiterating the point. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, the tabernacle itself. Remember, numbers, details, even down to the brass fittings, if you were here in our study with that. God planned it all out. It was God's idea for his presence on the ark to dwell in a tent. And God says, hey, I've never asked anyone to build me a tabernacle. See, Nathan the prophet is now learning that he spoke way too soon when he told David, yeah, go do it. Because it's not God's will for David to build a house for God. So now in verses 8 and 9, God gives a message to David via Nathan the prophet to remind David of all that the Lord has done. Look at verse 8. Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. There were at least a thousand other shepherd boys who were shepherding their flocks in Israel. But God chose David. It was God's decision. Verse 9, the Lord says, And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. David's fame had certainly spread. He was well known for his military exploits. God had delivered Israel from the invading armies. Remember, this is now a period of rest. Verse 10 and 11, the Lord continues. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, and you may want to underline this, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. Notice, God is far more interested in a dwelling place for his people than a resting place for the Ark of the Covenant. David wanted to build God a house, but God intends to build David a dynasty. David wants to build a tabernacle. God is going to design a house of kings from David's lineage, including the king of kings. For you and I tonight, maybe we're not temple builders. It may be in our heart to do something for the Lord, but it may not be what God has called you to do. It's not God's discipline. It's not God's rebuking. It may not even be in regard to anything sinful in our lives. Just simply, it's not his plans or his will for your life. I got to tell you, I struggle with this. There are so many things in my mind. I say, Lord, this is a great idea. We're going to proclaim the name of the Lord here in the city and let's go do it. And the Lord's like, Zip. 
How do you respond when you want to do something for God? With no selfish ambition, you believe, this, Lord, this would be awesome for you and your namesake, and people would get saved, and I'd be able to minister all these things. And God says, no. See, David has no idea at this point about his dynasty. Nor does David have any idea about how the Messiah, the Savior, will come from the house of David. All that is about to unfold. But first, God gives more incredible promises. Look at verses 12 through 16. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up a seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with a rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Who's God talking about here? He's talking about David's son, Solomon, the one who God will allow to build the temple. Verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be established, you may want to underline, forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, when you study history, you learn that the Davidic dynasty or the family of David's dynasty ended in the year 586 B.C. What happened in 586 B.C.? Well, that was when what happened? Nebuchadnezzar, right, and the Babylonians took control and sacked Jerusalem. And it was King Zedekiah who ruled, who was a descendant of David at that time. King Zedekiah died as a prisoner in Babylon. But there's more to this, isn't there? See, later on, the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis would study these scriptures and they would see the prophecy of a future king, a king who would come from this very lineage of David, who would reign forever. And the rabbis called this one the anointed one. In the Hebrew, that simply means what? Messiah. In the Greek, it means what? The Christ. So whenever you and I call Jesus of Nazareth Christ, we are declaring that Jesus is the heir. He is the fulfillment of God's promises here in these verses. This is why it's so important to study the lineages and the genealogies in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, right? So often we're like, oh, blah, 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 I get to the good stuff. No, all those genealogies prove that Jesus is from the lineage of David, fulfilling this promise. Verse 17. According to all these words and according to all this vision, So Nathan spoke to David. So David was just told, no. David, you cannot build God a house. But here's what else the Lord has said. And look at David's response, verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Don't you ever say the same thing? You look at how the Lord has had his hand upon you. And you say, Lord, who am I that you would call me? You would choose me? You would bless me? Verse 19, David continues. And yet, this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? See, David understood the eternal implications of God's prophecy here. 
Think about it. A forever throne. Forever is a long time, right? David is overwhelmed. Why? Because nobody loves like God loves. See, David tried to do God a small favor, but instead God blesses David. Folks, we cannot give God. Amen? Verse 20. David says, Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. Israel's psalmist, the great wordsmith and writer of nearly one half of all the psalms, is speechless at God's grace. And if you've ever tasted God's grace in your life, this is a common reaction, isn't it? To be speechless. To just sit back in awe and wonderment and say, God, look what you've done. Amongst all of our tribulations and our triumphs, I would encourage you to pause, make it a practice to pause and reflect on God's grace in your life and even on the lives of those you know. It has a way of changing our perspective when we do. Now, the rest of chapter 7, David recounts God's mercies on Israel and he utters an incredible prayer of thanksgiving. Let's read verses 21 through 24. David says, For your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on the earth, do you notice that? The one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. Verse 24. For you have made your people Israel, your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. Israel is a unique nation, isn't it? No other nation in the history of the world plays a pivotal role in God's eternal plans and purposes like Israel. Verse 25 through 29. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. Verse 27. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, verse 28, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it, and with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. Remember, God just told David no. No to building the temple. And please notice, God did not tell him why. God only said no. That can be brutal, can't it? You say, Lord, I want to do this for you. Lord, this would work out so good. I just know, God, if you just open this door, it's going to yield incredible fruit. And God says no, and he doesn't give a reason. And that can be a hard place to be in. We're told later that God said no to David's offer because David was a man of war. 
And God wanted a man of peace to build him a house. Look up on your screen at 1 Chronicles chapter 22. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all of his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon, for I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Oftentimes when God tells us no, he does not tell us why. We have to trust. But I want you to notice what David does after God says no. What does he do? Number one, he goes right back to the Lord. And now we're about to see step two of what David does in chapter eight. Chapter eight lists the military triumphs of King David. Verse one, after this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metheg Amma from the hand of the Philistines. When David became king, you remember, the Philistines were always the aggressors. Remember, they kept taking land and they had possessed cities that were rightfully Israel. But under David's leadership, Israel is now going on the offensive and taking this territory back from the Philistines. Verse 2, then David defeated Moab, <clears throat> forcing them down to the ground he measured them off with a line. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death, and with one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. Something is left unsaid in these verses, and we don't know what it is exactly. But remember, David's great-grandmother was who? Ruth, and Ruth was what? A Moabitess. But now, David goes and attacks those Moabites. What happened? There's all sorts of speculation. No one can say for sure. Verse 3 and 4. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. He's limiting his enemy's abilities to rise up in the future and revolt against him. Verses 5 through 12. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that had belonged to the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Beta and from Berthai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took a large amount of bronze. Verse 9. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, then Toi sent Joram, his son, to King David to greet him and bless him. He's like, I don't want to fight. Because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him, for Hadadezer had been at war with Toi, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, articles of gold, and articles of bronze. Verse 11. King David also dedicated these to the Lord. Notice that he dedicated the spoils to the Lord, along with the silver and the gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued, from Syria, from Moab, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, from Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. Now, if you were to study Old Testament history, you'll see that at this moment, Israel possessed more of the land that God had promised to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15 than at any other time in their history. This is really a golden type of age for Israel. David dedicates all the spoils to the Lord, and look at verse 13, and David made himself a name when he returned from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. This is a moment where David needs to be careful, isn't it? Unbridled success 
He's making a name. How many Christians have begun to wander away from the Lord at this moment? If you're taking notes, you may want to jot down Psalm 60. Psalm 60 was written, it says, a victim of David in the Valley of Salt. Most people think it took place here as David was fighting these battles. If you're also taking notes, you may want to jot down 1 Kings chapter 10. Because in 1 Kings 10, we read that by the time David's son Solomon takes the throne, that there's so much gold in Jerusalem that silver is counted as nothing. And another verse tells us that there's so much gold that silver was basically counted as rocks. That's a lot of gold. See, David is setting the stage for his son Solomon to build the temple in the future. Verse 14. He also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons. And all the Edomites became David's servants, and the Lord preserved David wherever he went. This is essentially the summary of the entire chapter of chapter 8. Every victory, every enemy subdued, was simply a testimony of the Lord preserving David as king over Israel. Now you may be sitting there wondering, why do I care about these names and about these battles? It's like, blah, 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 whatever. Why even just go through this? Can't we just kind of skip to the good stuff? Well, no, this is the good stuff. See, because these verses in chapter 8 demonstrate that David didn't sit around and mope. David didn't sit around and pout. He wasn't all angry at God saying, God, I wanted to do this for you and you said no. No, David got going with what he could do for the Lord. Can we say the same? When God says no and closes a door and oftentimes not giving us a reason or an explanation, do we still get busy with our hand to the plow and not looking back for the Lord and the things that we can do? Or in frustration, do we kind of shut the engines down and take our foot off the gas and say, well, God, you said no to this, so I guess I just can't do anything. Or is that just me sometimes? Verses 15 through 18 list the key members of David's administration. It's essentially his presidential cabinet. Verse 15. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered judgment and justice to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahulud, was a recorder. A recorder is simply the rememberer or the historian. Verse 17 and 18. Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. Sariah was a scribe. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief ministers. Now, again, David's still conquering in battles. He's getting all this gold and all this silver. What's he doing? He's paving the way for someone else to do what God's going to call them to do, but he can't do himself. And there's no pride in there from David, is there? He doesn't say, well, if I can't do it, nobody's doing it. No, David's willing to let another do it, and he'll even help if he can. Now, as we move to our last chapter tonight, chapter 9, if you remember in 1 Samuel chapter 20, the last time David was in King Saul's court, when he left King Saul's court for good, David promised his best friend Jonathan that he would be kind to Jonathan's descendants. And so in chapter 9, it's David fulfilling that word. Let's begin chapter 9, verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, we just saw several minutes ago in chapter 7, David wanted to do something for God, right? And he proposed to build a temple for God. God said no. 
So now, David asks another question that we should all be asking. What's that question? Hey, what can I do for others? Scholars differ and debate over how long, at this moment in chapter 9, David has been sitting on the throne as king. Most scholars believe David's now been you know, sitting on the throne for about 15 years. So picture the scene. It's likely that David's sitting on the throne and he thinks of his old dear friend Jonathan. You can imagine it, right? David wishing his friend Jonathan were there to see all the Lord had done. David's missing the, the fellowship, the camaraderie. He's, he's missing his deceased friend. And in verse 1, it's a question that David asks that is an absolute remarkable display of love. Why? Because remember, Saul had made himself an enemy of David. Remember, Saul pursued and tried to murder David for about 15 years. It was customary in those days for the king of a new dynasty to absolutely massacre any living relatives of the prior dynasty. But that's not David's heart, is it? David does not have revenge in mind. He has love in mind. David asks, hey, what can I do for the family of my enemy? Don't let that pass you. David says, what can I do for the family of my enemy? Verse 2 and 3. And there was a servant of the house of Saul, whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul? You may want to underline this if you're taking notes. To whom I may show the kindness of God. Pause here. David's desire is to show someone else the same kindness that God had lavished upon him. You know, I bet all of us in this room tonight are kind. I hope we're kind to others. But this got me thinking this week. We may be kind, but do we really show the kindness of God to others? See, when we remember God's grace and how he's lavished it upon us, we can't help but be gracious to others. Verse 3 continues, And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. We know that this man, his name is Mephibosheth. And we first saw him a few weeks ago back in chapter 4. You can look up on your screen. It says, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she was made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, his nurse, gathered the little boy in a panic, fearing the leader of the new dynasty, King David, would execute every potential heir of King Saul's dynasty. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Verse 4. So the king, David, said to Ziba, Where is he? Speaking of Mephibosheth. <clears throat> And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lo Deba. Please notice in verse 4 that Mephibosheth doesn't even have his own house. Instead, he had to live in the house of another man. There's no SSI, there's no disability. He's depending upon the goodness of others to survive. That name, Lo-Debar, is significant. It means 
no pasture. It's describing where Mephibosheth lives. He's living in a barren place without the ability to walk, depending upon others for everything. This is a brutal existence. And as we go through this chapter, you likely have already seen there's a picture that's being painted for every single person. And it's the picture of Jesus Christ, our King. Because who is it that does the initiating here? It's not Mephibosheth. It's the King. It's the King reaching out to the lame. Verse 5. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Lodibar would be a very sparsely populated place. So you better be sure when the king's messengers show up at the front door of where Mephibosheth live, excuse me, Mephibosheth lives. Everyone is watching, and Mephibosheth is thinking, that's it. I'm done for. See, Mephibosheth had the wrong idea about the king. He thinks the king is angry. He thinks the king is upset. But he's wrong. He's about to be blessed and overwhelmed by the grace of the king. So now, they say, Mephibosheth, you're coming to Jerusalem. So they need to load him up. They either carry him somehow, they have to transport him on the back of an animal, drag him. However, they take this lame man from his house and bring him to meet the king. I wonder what was going through Mephibosheth's mind on that rocky, bumpy journey as each step drew him closer to Jerusalem. Verse 6. <clears throat> now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. I want you to place yourself in David's sandals for a moment. Think of the emotions that are flooding David's heart at this moment. Hey, sons look like their dads. How closely did Mephibosheth's resemblance remind David of Jonathan? Or even resemble grandpa. His grandpa was Saul. Those Memories, those emotions come flooding back in. David, perhaps amazed by the resemblance, and he calls out, calls him out by name. Mephibosheth? Isn't this how you and I got saved? The king of kings called us out by name, amen? Like two of you. Okay, let me explain this. The Bible tells us that God chose us, right? The king called us by name, just like David called Mephibosheth by name, right? You with me? Okay. Scaring me a little bit. What's going through Mephibosheth's mind at this moment? Think of his life. Imagine you're five years old. And you hear the cries and the wailing outside your door. And the news falls upon his ears that his daddy Jonathan has just died. And his grandpa Saul. And his uncles, all Jonathan's brother, all of his brothers have died in battle. I've been around a few times now, five-year-olds and six-year-olds, when they learn of a parent's death. They can't fully process it. They hear it, but it's not process. So picture the scene of this five-year-old boy. And then through the wailing of everyone's tears upon the news, the household turns into a complete 
panicked frenzy. They're scrambling because they're told you need to flee so the new king won't hunt you down and hurt you. What's happening in the heart of this five-year-old boy amidst this chaos? So Mephibosheth's nurse picks him up, five years old, and she begins to run, utter panic. If you've ever tried to run with a five-year-old, it's not easy. And she stumbles, she trips, and she falls. And what we just saw in 2 Samuel 4, evidently he breaks his legs or he breaks his ankles. Something happens, and at that moment, this little five-year-old boy who just lost his daddy, just lost his grandpa, just lost his uncles, is now lame for the rest of his life. And there's no surgeons, no orthopedic specialists, no doctors to properly set it in a cast. But they need to leave because they think that this new king is going to kill them. Can you imagine the physical pain that this little five-year-old boy went through with every step, that he was being carried, the jostling, the rocky terrain. And not just the physical pain, the emotional toil of trying to process that his daddy was now dead. Mephibosheth spent all of his life living a great distance away from the king because he did not know what the king is like. Verse 7, so David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Mephibosheth is frightened. How do we know that? Because David says, do not fear. David tells Mephibosheth four things here if you look at the verse. Verse 7. He says, do not fear. He says, I will show you kindness. David says, I will restore. And fourth, David says, you will eat bread continually. In fact, David says you will eat bread continually three more times in verses 10, 11, and 13. Remember, it's easy for us to just go get food at the supermarket. Way different back in those days. David gives Mephibosheth these four promises. And isn't this what God has done for each and every one of us through Jesus Christ? We once sat on the throne of our own hearts, declared ourselves as king over our own lives. And yet God has called us. And he's shown us kindness. He's giving us an inheritance. And he's invited us to his table. Make no mistake, we are all Mephibosheths. Mephibosheth, too, was blessed on the account, not of his own doing, but on account of someone else. Aren't we blessed because of the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us? See, for you and I, God shows favor to us because of Christ. And God invites us to his table. God treats us as his own. Hey, as believers, as followers in Jesus, we've been adopted into God's family. Just as David is now about to adopt Mephibosheth into his family. Look at verse 8. Then he bowed himself, and Mephibosheth said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? A dead dog simply means a worthless an insignificant person in light of such incredible grace. Verse 9, And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son 
all that belong to Saul and to all his house. You may want to underline that word all. All that belong to Saul and to all his house. He gives them all. Hey, the king holds nothing back. Jesus Christ holds nothing back. So when he tells us no, from back in chapter 7, we need to remember that he holds nothing back. And according to his will, it's perfect. Verse 10. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son. So this is David talking to Ziba. Look how he calls Mephibosheth now. He keeps calling him his son. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. David didn't just give all the land back. David gives Mephibosheth an army of servants to also work the land. And the food from the land would be used to feed Mephibosheth's family. Because Mephibosheth will now sit and dine with King David. Verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Once again, we see a picture of our king, don't we? See, as Christians, you and I aren't just forgiven. We're not just kind of sliding into heaven like, whew, that was close. We're not going to get to heaven and be like, oh, man, God stuck with me. Sorry, Lord, I made it in at the tail end. No, Jesus Christ died for you and for me. He desires that we would be at his table to be with him in heaven forevermore. He loves you and me that, might, that much despite of who we are. Despite of our fumbles and our failures and our foibles, he loves us so much, he says, I want to spend eternity with you. Is that not grace? Never forget, you're a child of the one true king. What was it we did to deserve such treatment from God? Well, Lord, you know I am pretty awesome. No, no, no. We did nothing. We deserve nothing. And this is what makes grace so powerful. Because it's God pouring out when we don't deserve it. Just like Mephibosheth, folks, we're lame. It's all the king who initiates it. Verse 12 and 13 as we finish the chapter. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. That name means who's like Jehovah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. You may want to underline that at the end of verse 13. Because here is the uncomfortable truth. Mephibosheth is overwhelmed by an incalculable ocean of grace. Yet what does the end of verse 13 tell us? He was still lame. That means that Mephibosheth still had to face the day-to-day difficulties of being disabled. Even though he's swimming in a sea of God's grace, he will not be made new and whole until heaven. And you and I are the same way, aren't we? Each one of us in this room have our own trials, our own tribulations, our own pain, 
our own sufferings. All of us have a certain measure of that lameness, of that hindrance, whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, whatever it may be, we all have it in each one of our lives. And God has appointed that we walk by faith through that until we are made whole and new in his image one day in heaven. David's grace to Mephibosheth is an incredible picture of God's grace to you and I. Just like Mephibosheth, we were hiding from God. We were poor spiritually. We were weak. We were lame. And we were fearful before our king came to get us. We were separated from our king because of our wicked ancestors and our own deliberate choices. We had separated ourselves from the king because we had no idea of the king's love for us. Just like David, our king sought us out before we sought him. Our king's kindness is extended to us for the sake of another because of Jesus. Our king's kindness is based on a covenant. Our king is amazing. We serve an incredible king. You and I are received as sons and daughters at the king's table. And we have access to him anytime we want. And we deserve none of it. Isn't God amazing? I asked Jim if he would uh, play a few extra worship songs for us tonight. So I'm going to ask... Jim to come on up and Chris. We're just going to have an extended...